The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. In the last lecture, we were focused on the proteasome, um, and we were focusing on how you targeted the protein of interest for degradation um, by attachment of ubiquitin. So here's the model that I presented at the very beginning, and right now we're focused on how do you attach ubiquitins to a protein of interest that's going to be degraded. Okay, and so here's the protein of interest. Um, the last time we talked about all the linkages were going to be isopeptides where you have a lysine on the surface or a lysine that's accessible that can then get attached to ubiquitin, which at a C terminal end um, has glycine, which at a C terminal end has a glycine. So that's glycine 76. That's the linkage common to everything. Um, and then this ubiquitin, you can see from the structure, has a number of lysines attached, depending on what the function is um, of the ubiquitin. Um, it can be attached almost anywhere for the proteasome. We're focused on lysine 48, okay, which again makes an isopeptide linkage here, and you need multiple ubiquitins um, to be able to get your protein of interest degraded. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is talk about the equipment that's required to attach this ubiquitin molecule through the glycine to the protein of interest. Um, and so what we're focused on is the three enzymes, E1, E2, E3. So we want to look at the attachment and we're going to look at E1, E2, E3 and what their function is in general. Um, and so E1, and it turns out in human systems there are only two of these proteins by, again, by homology. Um, and this is going to be what they call the activating enzyme. Okay, and so, um, so E1 is going to be, so since we have thousands of proteins that are going to be degraded and only one of these E1s, it's going to play a role um, in many, many reactions. It's sort of the linchpin. Um, over there, there's a cartoon of what I'm going to write on the board. Um, but E1, um, and when, when we look at the chemistry, a key player in the chemistry are cysteines and covalent cotalysis um, by forming thioesters. Okay, you've now seen this. Um, many times in the polyketide synthases, you've seen it in fatty acid synthases, you've seen it in cysteine proteases. This is a motif that nature uses um, over and over again. Um, and what she does is takes ATP and then she takes ubiquitin. And I'm just going to put G is the G76 at the C terminal end. Okay, so this is the C terminal carboxylate. Um, and what she does then is uses ATP to activate the carboxylate so that it can be attached to the cysteine, um, which then forms the thioester. Okay, and sort of the strategy is the same. I'm not going to write out the details of this strategy, but there are two ways ATP can be used. How, what does ATP use to activate this into a good dehydrating agent? What, it, what does nature do? What, were the, what are the two options? So, or adenylate or phosphorylate, alpha or gamma. You see this over and over and over again. You've seen this used many, many times um, in the first half of this course where you've talked about the tRNA synthetases, the, um, the activating domains of the non ribosomal peptide synthetases, and so. What you've done in this reaction is activated the carboxylate, and 
just remember this so I don't have to keep writing this down. The G is there. It's always attached to the C terminus of ubiquitin. And now what happens, so this is activated, and so you have a, a base. You never do any chemistry with a thiol. Um, and so one then forms a thioester um, by nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl. Okay. So what one ends up with then in the first step is ubiquitin attached covalently um, to E1. Okay, so let me put that up. Again, all of this, all of this is written down in, in your handouts. Um, and so what we have now is E1, um, where we have S attached to ubiquitin. Okay, so that's the activating step. The second step is, um, involves an E2, and that's called the ubiquitin, um, is called the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. So this is gonna react with E2, the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. And we'll, what we see in, in um, humans again, that there are about 40 of these proteins, okay? We still have thousands of proteins that are gonna be targeted for degradation. So that would imply that these E2s can be used in multiple processes during the targeting process for degradation. So we're gonna see that E2, and so there are 40 of these, okay? And we'll see that E2 also has um, has um, a sulfhydro group that is going to play a key role in this reaction. So what we're going to do now is a simple thio trans esterification. So we're going to uh, transfer um, the ubiquitin to E2, okay, by thio trans esterification. So again, you have base and you liberate E1, and now what you have is E2 <coughs> with the attached ubiquitin. <coughs> okay, so there were 40 of these things, and what does that have to tell you? What does that tell you about E1 and E2? I haven't given you any information about structure, but there are 40 E2s, so they obviously all have different structures. But these things are gonna be really flexible. Um, and so we have a few structures, but I don't think it even comes close to allowing us to understand really sort of the specificity of, of um, this, these processes. And this is a major focus of many people now. Um, they've been discovered for a long time, but people are still messing around. And I think part of the complexity relates to the flexibility, which makes them harder to, harder to crystallize. Okay, and so um, E3 are the ubiquitin ligases. Um, and the latest paper I read, I, I, they keep finding new ones, but there are greater than 600 of these guys. Okay, so even there, since more proteins are targeted for degradation than 600, um, E3s um, are gonna be used multiple times. And E3s are able to form protein complexes. And I'm, again, I'm giving you a sort of a generic overview, but you'll see in the next module um, one of the key proteins involved in iron homeostasis gets targeted for degradation by a ubiquitin ligase that exists in a complicated protein um, complex. So that then adds to the complexity you need to target all of your proteins specifically um, for degradation in some fashion. Okay, so what does E3 do? So, so we have an E2 and we have an E2 with ubiquitin attached. Um, and E2 needs to interact with E3, okay? And this, again, is complex. Um, it's not a single, necessarily, a single polypeptide. Um, and E3 interacts, ultimately we wanna do 
is attached ubiquitin to our protein of interest. So E3 interacts with the protein of interest. And as I alluded to before, but I'm not going to talk about in any detail, what is the basis of interaction of a protein? You know, it's going around, it's doing its function. How do you target it for degradation? And generally, you target for degradation um, by the N-terminal modification or by post-translational modification. And every protein is different. So you might phosphorylate it, you might hydroxylate it. Um, in fact, I told you, and Liz had told you um, in the section on clip X and clip P that there was this thing called the N N rule. Okay. So one of the things you can do is you can attach different amino acids to the N terminus. And in fact, um, tRNAs are actually used to do that. And we're not going to talk about the details of that. But these things, you know, you have so many proteins that are floating around. How you're going to subtly control when you're going to degrade it is not trivial, and that's a focus of many um, people's attention. So the model here is that, remember, everything we're doing is isopeptide linkages, okay? So this needs to be set up. This complex needs to be set up. So um, the lysine to which the ubiquitin is going to be attached needs to be adjacent um, to the ubiquitin. So you have a lysine needs to be activated for nucleophilic attack. Um, and now you've attached um, your ubiquitin. Okay, so, um, so this is um, a direct transfer. Again, you're forming the isopeptides. And remember um, that we said in the very beginning, you don't just have one ubiquitin, you have many ubiquitins. Somebody asked me after class, how do you get the many ubiquitins attached. Um, it turns out that people have started to study this in some detail, and in many cases, the E2s and the E3s interact in a processive way to attach multiple ubiquitins. It was, I give you a reference, and um, a reference if anybody wants to read about this, it was published um, a couple of years ago about how you control polyubiquitination. And one of the handouts, they had an E4. There could be E4s that also act processively um, to attach ubiquitins. So you can attach more than one to give you basically the protein of interest with the ubiquitins actually attached. Okay, so um, that is the machinery. We know quite a bit about this machinery, but that's all I'm going to actually say um, in this class. But every system, there are a lot of people studying this, um, and there are very few of these that are understood in really sort of molecular detail. So the, here again is, again, that you have these kinds of I isopeptide um, linkages. Here's the ubiquitin with the carboxylate end. Here's the ubiquitin with a lysine 48, which you can attach additional ubiquitins to. And here's another cartoon of this overall process. So what I didn't tell you in general is that E3s come in flavors. So they have little domains in them. They have het. Is that what it's called? I can't remember the names of these domains. I haven't, yeah, HEC, H-E-C-T domains, HEC domains, ring domains, U domains, um, all of which are distinct and play a role in the details of how this process actually works. So again, this is something I don't expect you to remember the details from, but this is what you can imagine happening. So in the cartoon over here, this is what I just described, um, that we have an E2 that has this little ball as the ubiquitin, okay? Here's our protein of interest, S. And so what happens is E2 is attaching ubiquitin uh, to the protein of interest, okay? So that's one possibility. Um, and in this case, the transfer is directly from E2, and that's what the ones that have been studied, the ring finger, um, containing domains do, okay? Alternatively, you can imagine that E2 could transfer ubiquitin to e E3, okay? So, and once it attaches it to E3, 
E3 could attach it to the protein of interest. So all of those are possible, and there's been one case where that's been studied, where E3 attaches the ubiquitin. So I think you're going to find, actually, many variations of this theme. This is an old paper, I think. Um, and I think uh, the more people study it, probably the more complex it will end up getting. Um, and so that's basically sort of the machinery with the major consideration, which I think is, is actually quite interesting from a biochemical p point of view, is the N, N rule. Um, how do you modify the N to target it for degradation? Does it have a half-life of two minutes? Does it have a half-life of two hours? And what governs all of that? And you can imagine that post-translational modification also um, governs the half-life. So both of those possible, and those of you interested in um, polyubiquitination, um, can look at that reference. And in fact, that paper uses methodologies we've talked about in class and recitation too. They use rapid chemical quench technology um, to measure the rate constants for putting on multiple ubiquitins. So this rapid chemical quench technology continues to appear over and over again when you want to look at more details about how these systems actually work. Okay. So, um, that is allowing us to get to the stage where the ubiquitin is attached to the protein of interest. So, and that is via um, the chamber of doom, the 20S, prote the 20S proteasome. But now what we also would like to look at a little bit, and this, this is a very active area of research, is the lid. Okay, and you saw clip X in addition to clip P before. And so I just want to spend a minute, so on the 19S lid of the proteasome. Um, and this lid has proteins coming and going. Um, and when you isolate it, you probably lose proteins that are loosely bound, okay? So this is, again, a complex. You can tell that from this cartoon over here, uh, a, a machine of 15 to 20 proteins. Okay, and if you look at this machine, there's been a lot of people, actually one of Bob Sauer's students at Berkeley has spent a lot of time studying um, this human counterpart and has done a lot of really beautiful cryo-EM on this. So again, this methodology we've been talking about has been used. Why are they using cryo-EM? Because you can imagine this is really hard to get a picture of because it's moving around a lot. Um, so if we look over here, um, what you will see is um, that you have a species um, called RP2, uh, RPT, which, and there are six of these, okay? So they're all slightly different, and this is part of an AAA ATPase system. So you have um, the RPT equivalent, one through six, um, and this is an ATPase and it sits on top of the proteasome. Okay, so its function is exactly like what you guys learned about with clip X and clip P. What does it do? It's gonna pull to try to unfold the protein, and it's going to use ATP hydrolysis to then try to thread the protein into the chamber of doom. So, the model, which hasn't been anywhere near as well studied, the best studied system is the one that Liz talked about, that's why we chose to look at this, is sort of doing the same thing. It's just there's orders of level more complexity associated with this. You can imagine how complicated this is in terms of thinking about from, from the Saunders single molecule talk, you can imagine this is even more complicated. So what do you have here that's also similar to the CLIP, um, X clip P system Here's a hexamer, and remember that we looked at beta and alpha, that they were sevenmers. So again, just like with clip X and clip P, you have a mismatch. So we have um, a hexamer, heptamer, mismatch, just like you did before. And why nature has chosen to do this, um, I don't know, but remember even the beta subunit, the alpha subunits are inactive, the beta subunits are only three out of the seven are active, so 
It's just really quite complex. Now, what are the other things that could be involved, uh, these other proteins could be involved in? Well, now, what's distinct from the two we had in the CLIP um, XP system, you had something that re re recognized the SSRA tags, or you had adapter proteins. So here what we need is something that recognizes um, the ubiquitins. Um, and these could be, in, in the handouts I've given you, they tell you which one of these is which. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. But you have RPN proteins um, that recognize ubiquitins. OK, and I have another. People are starting to get cryo-EM pictures of all of this. This is a paper in 2012. Um, here's the protein of interest. Here is the AAA type ATPA system that needs to unfold the protein of interest and thread it um, into the chamber of doom. Um, and you have binding sites for the polyubiquitin tail. Okay, so that's one thing you need to do, to do um, with your lid proteins. Uh, a second thing you need to do is that nature recycles the ubiquitins. So what you have um, is enzymes that are called de-ubiquitin enzymes. I think that's whatever they label down here. Um, R11 and this molecule, UP6, are de-ubiquitin. Sorry. Um, OK, spare dubs. OK, yeah, so they are. Um, both of these guys are involved in clipping off the ubiquitins and recycling. So you have another set of proteins. D ubiquitinating um, enzymes. And you have an isopeptide linkage, remember? Um, and what kind of an enzyme might you expect a D ubiquitin enzyme D ubiquitin enzyme to be? What kind of activity would it have? We want to cut these things off. What are you going to do? Protease, OK. And it turns out almost all of them, they're, they're, again, we're, we're identifying them continually. They're not so sequence identifiable by looking at bioinformatics. They're all, the ones that have been looked at are all um, cysteine proteases. So the ones that have been studied in detail are cysteine proteases. But remember, they're re recognizing isopeptide linkages, not peptide linkages. Um, and as in the case of cysteine proteases, what do they involve? They involve covalent catalysis. So again, here's another example of stuff you learn in the first part of the course that you're gonna, you see over and over and over again um, in nature. And hopefully, this is now um, becoming second nature to you guys that these kinds of processes actually happen. OK. So, um, so this is the lid. I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, you see the equipment. You see how complicated it is. And every system you study in biology, and if you care about the regulation, you're probably going to have to think about degradation. And you're going to have to individually look at the proteins of interest and figure out what the E2s and the E3s are um, and what the signals are that control this overall process. So this was just taken out of some recent review, but it just gives you an idea of um, where you see, this is a couple of years old now, but where you see this kind of machinery, we're going to see it in the next section. Um, we're going to see a key player in sensing iron um, is degraded um, by ubiquitination. Okay. In addition, you can imagine progression through the cell cycle, apoptosis, um, immune surveillance, they're all regulated by protein-mediated degradation. So this is a fundamental mechanism of regulation. And so having, I think, a cartoon overview that I've given you in class is really important to have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about the system um, that you might be working on. And this was a paper that was very recently published. And so we've been focusing on cholesterol homeostasis. And remember, when I introduced this topic, we were talking about NSIG and HMG-CoA reductase, OK? And HMG-CoA reductase is targeted for degradation by NSIG. That's why we made this digression. Um, and 
if you go back now um, and look at what people have pulled out of the literature, we're going to look today very briefly at GP78. In your problem set due this week, we'll see that GP78, which people thought was the whole story, is not the whole story, that there's another um, E3. Hopefully, you'll get that out of the data that I've given you um, in problem set three. And there's yet another. Um, Another system involved in cholesterol um, degradation of HMG-CoA reductase, but it's not limited to HMG-CoA reductase, okay? Um, one also has degradation of the transcription factors, SREBP. We talked about those. Uh, they use different um, targeting enzymes. And furthermore, a lot of people have been studying the enzymes involved in cholesterol efflux, and again, these enzymes here are also targeted for degradation. So the timing of all this and what's recognized um, is central to think, people thinking about regulation, um, not only in systems in general, but um, cholesterol um, specifically. Okay, so that's a summary of everything we've said. And finally, what I want to do now is just come back um, to where we started in this section and to finish up. Um, and where we started was um, we were looking at um, the second mechanism of regulation and the key role of NSIG that you've already set, seen plays a key role in SREBP um, control, keeping it in the endoplasmic reticulum. So now we're coming back and looking at H. And G reductase um, and the role of NSIG in targeting its degradation. Okay. And so we've seen these players now over and over and over again, so I'm not going to keep drawing the structures out on the board. Um, but remember, um, if you have high cholesterol, what do, you, what do you want to do with HMG-CoA reductase if you have high cholesterol? The what? Inhibit it. Yeah, you want to inhibit it. And so the way you inhibit it um, is um, you target it to remain in the ER. Okay. And so the question then is then how does NSIG in, in and HMGR in the presence of cholesterol, and it turns out the signal is not cholesterol itself, but the signal is lanosterol. And we talked about that very briefly a couple of times. Where do you see lanosterol? If you go back to the biosynthetic pathway, it's sort of in the middle. Okay, so this is, so you have, you have acetyl-CoA, you have lanosterol, and you have another 19 steps before you get to cholesterol. And somehow this senses, um, this senses lanosterol, and people are trying to understand the details of that. How do you really know that's true? That's not such an easy thing as we've talked about um, in recitation. So um, what we want to do then is retain HMG-CoA reductase in the ER. So these are both ER bound. Um, and in the presence of lanosterol, we want to target HMG-CoA reductase for degradation. Okay, that's the goal. Okay, and that's, the question is, is how did people go about studying that? Okay, and so it turns out that they have discovered three proteins, at least in one of these systems. Um, and the protein that um, I'm going to talk about for a very brief period of time is GP78. Um, that was glycoprotein 78. Tells you something about its molecular weight. Again, I don't re re expect you to remember the details, but GP78 interacts with NSIG. Okay, and if you go back and you look at the little cartoons I've given you, NSIG, again, has lots of transmembrane helices and is stuck um, in the ER. Okay, so what do we know about GP78? And again, you see the, these cartoons that 
Liz has used and I've been using since we really know nothing um, about the detailed structures of these systems. Um, what we know is at the end terminus, um, we have an in sig binding site. And so people had to study that, and how did they study that? Probably by mechanisms similar to what you had a, to what you thought about looking at problem set um, seven. Um, it turns out that GP78 is a ubiquitin ligase, so it's an E3. So this is um, an E3 ubiquitin ligase. Okay, so this is. GP78 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. It has a ring domain. Remember we said there were little domains that alter the way you stick the ubiquitin on. Again, we don't know the details about this. It has another little domain um, called UBC7. We're really into acronym worlds, but what you need to know is that this is an E2 conjugating enzyme. So what you have now is an E3 that combined an E2. That's the cartoons we just went through. Um, we went through over here, E3 binding to E2. E3 is the GP78. E2 is um, this little protein domain. And I think what's really interesting about this protein is it has another little domain called VPC. Um, and this is an ATPase. And if you think about this, if you want to um, target something for degradation, where, where is the proteasome located that we've been talking about? What, where is it located in the cell? Actually, there are multiple proteasomes, but the ones we've been focused on, where is it located? Cytosol? Yeah, cytosol. So this is a membrane protein. So how do you get this membrane protein into the proteasome. Okay, that's not trivial. And this protein, this VPC domain, uses energy somehow to pull this out of the membrane so it can get degraded in the proteasome. So the VPC domain So the VPC domain quote pulls um, HMGR out of membrane. Um, and so it gets degraded in the cytosol by the proteasome. Okay. Complicated, actually quite interesting, yeah. Is it at all understood how that pulling up happens? I don't, you know, maybe, I don't, I don't know how, I haven't found anything, but I haven't looked through the literature or any, any of this, the details. My guess is the answer is no, but you can go look it up. Um, and one of the questions you can ask is, how frequent does that happen? How often do you want to degrade? Do you have this domain and how often is that domain used and what are the characteristics of that domain? Probably a lot more is known. I don't really know off the top of my head, okay? So this is a cartoon model and so I'm not gonna draw the model out. So I'll say the model and you see your PowerPoint. Okay, and so um, this is the same kind of cartoon we've been using over and over again. So NSIG is the center guy. NSIG interacts with scap and cholesterol to keep SREBP um, in the ER membrane so you don't activate transcription of cholesterol biosynthesis or the LDL receptor. We spent a lot of time on this. So here NSIG is here again and it interacts um, with GP 78, which interacts with these other two um, proteins, um, the E2 and whatever this protein is that helps um, re extract it from the membrane. Um, a key player in all of this is lanosterol. So when you have um, lanosterol in the membranes, um, so you could do potentially a similar study that we talked about 
um, in recitation this past week to look at, do you see a switch with linosterol? What are the linosterol concentrations? What are the concentrations of linosterol? Um, and the, this is a cartoon showing this. I have no idea about the details of this cartoon, but what you're going to do then is attach um, the ubiquitin using this E2, E3 machinery um, onto HMG CoA reductase. And remember, that protein, we've looked at that now a number of times, has a steroid, sterol um, sensor domain, which is linosterol, okay? And it also has a cytoplasmic face, that's the HMG CoA reductase. You can cut this off, it's also active, and we've talked about that a number of times. And so what they have here is just a cartoon of attaching ubiquitin, which then, in the end, magic, you end up with degradation of your um, membrane-bound system. So this is a major mechanism of regulation um, of involving cholesterol homeostasis. But what you see when you look at the problem set um, that I've given you is that it's more complicated than that. So you can knock out genes and do you still get it degraded? What is the time scale? How do you do the experiments? And I think that's what people are seeing with all of these things. Um, and in part, it becomes um, complicated because if these proteins need to be modified in some way, it's not so easy to tell whether they've been modified and what it is that is recognized um, by the E3 um, ligase. Okay, so um, I think this is sort of an exciting and interesting area. We need some new breakthroughs. Um, so that we can better understand how these degradation systems are integrated into regulation um, in general. So that's just a summary of um, the role of NSIG in the presence of cholesterol or linosterol uh, in keeping the levels of cholesterol low. Okay, so um, we finished the section on cholesterol, I think, I've introduced you to a lot of different kinds of concepts. I've told you how important it is um, in terms of therapeutics. Um, people are continually studying this, um, as you saw by um, the news article that Liz had given me last time. Um, we have this PCSK9 that's in clinical trials in addition to the statins, and I think it's going to be on people's radar screens um, for some time to come. So um, I think cholesterol is cool because of the spectacular discoveries of receptor-mediated and the cytosis of transcription factors that are found in the ER as opposed to being found in the nucleus. And we've also introduced you to another generic mechanism of control, that by protein-mediated degradation. Okay, so um, that's the end of module five, and what I'm gonna do now, and we've posted this information. Again, the information will always be posted ahead of class so that you can actually have the PowerPoints out there so that uh, some things I'm not gonna write down. There's a lot more, in this section, there's a lot more phenomenology, okay? What I'll try to do is give you an overview of why I've picked this phenomenology, but I'm not gonna write down, it takes a long time to write down all the phenomenology on the blackboard, and I'm not gonna do that. So integrating your notes of the things I'm gonna write down with your PowerPoint, I think is really important for you. You do, and I would suggest that you bring the PowerPoint, you can see what's written down and where you might wanna stick in a piece of paper where I expand on something or really tell you something in much more detail than um, what's written in the PowerPoints. Okay, so module six, so we, as, as I just told you at the very begin, beginning, um, these modules are not really linked together except through thinking about homeostasis. Everything in the cell is homeostasis. Um, and we're gonna be, in the first lecture, we're gonna be talking about metals and metal homeostasis in general, using the periodic table. Okay, but then what I'm gonna do is focus on a single metal, and the single metal I'm gonna be focused on um, is iron. Um, and so, the reading is also posted, um, and there are three things for you to read. One is to think about iron 
um, in the geochemical world. You know, why is iron so important? If you look at the periodic table, why aren't we using aluminum? It's the most abundant in the Earth's crust. Okay, why are we using iron and not aluminum? Well, as chemists, we had to be able to think about that. This silicon is the other thing that's one of the most abundant things in the Earth's crust. Why aren't we using silica and alumina as our life, um, as a basis for life? And this article, I think, is very interesting from a chemical perspective, telling you about how to think about these kinds of things. Why is it true? And I'll give you a little bit of background on that. And then you can do as much or as little thinking about it um, as you choose. The second, um, we're going to, so the first one, I'm just going to give you um, an overview of why metals are so darn important, okay, um, and try to convince you that you should all know a lot more about metals than probably most of you have thought about from an introductory um, course. Um, then in lecture two, um, or I'm going to talk about metal homeostasis in general, okay, and that's going to be that would, could be applied to any of the metals I'm going to show you in the periodic table, but I'm going to focus on iron, okay. And then in the second lecture, we're going to focus on um, iron homeostasis in humans. Um, and we're going to look at iron transport from the diet, where we heard this from. How does it get taken into the cell? It can get taken into the cell. We'll see a number of ways, but receptor-mediated endocytosis, where have we seen that? Um, so we have, um, there's a protein that allows iron to be transferred around. Just like with cholesterol, you had to figure out how to keep this insoluble thing um, soluble. With, we're going to see there's a lot of problems with iron, so we need to figure out how to control iron's chemical reactivity. So we use a protein to do that. Um, there's a transferrin, it's a little protein called transferrin. There's a transferrin receptor. Um, we'll talk about that. And then um, there are are many levels at which iron is regulated. Um, there are peptide, the, probably the most important regulation is a peptide hormone that I'll briefly mention, but that's not what I'm going to focus on. What I'm going to focus on is a new kind of regulation um, based on uh, regulation of the translational process and uh, proteins binding to RNA. Um, and right now, that's a very active area of research. It doesn't have to be a protein binding to RNA, but small molecules binding to RNA. Riboswitches are being found all over the place. And so I'm going to introduce you um, to translational control um, by proteins binding to RNA. And then um, the third and fourth lectures are going to be focused on uh, more on bacteria. We know a lot about bacterial systems. Um, this is um, bacteria, uh, almost all bacteria require iron to survive. Um, and Liz is the expert, so she can correct anything I say incorrectly during this lecture. Um, but it's really bacteria, how, where did bacteria get their iron from? Some bacteria get their iron from rocks. Okay, how the heck do you get iron out of a rock? Okay, well, bacteria have figured that out. We, on the other hand, are way up here. We can eat bacteria, we can eat plants. They've already figured out how to get the iron out of the rocks. And so our problem is much easier. But um, so bacteria are amazingly creative, and I've just chosen one of the creative ways um, to look at how iron um, is obtained. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the host pathogen battle, and I'm going to use specifically Staphylococcus aureus as an example because of the resistance problems we currently have in the clinic. And we're going to focus on, you can get iron in many forms. We're going to focus on getting iron in the form of heme, which is a major um, source of iron for this organism. OK, so that's where we're going. OK, will we get finished in four lectures? Probably not. OK. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so what I'm going to do today is the first five or six slides of PowerPoint, and it's more phenomenology. OK, and then we'll get into it. Um, the more details um, in the next lecture. Okay, so here's um, the vitamin bottle. Do, do any of you take Flintstone vitamins? Okay, and I'm not supposed to digress. I can't swallow vitamins, so I like them because they taste good. Okay. Huh? Do you, do you remember? Did, does anybody remember who he, this guy is? No. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Say so, man, Fred. Okay. Well, you know, I always have this generation. I, I'm much older than you. Anyhow. Um, 
So anyhow, I mean, what you learned about in introductory course 507 is you learned a lot about the vitamin bottle, really. How the vitamins that you have, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin, all the vitamin Bs, et cetera, what they do is greatly expand the repertoire of reactions that enzymes can catalyze in all your metabolic pathways. What you don't learn about in most introductory courses is the minerals. Okay, so they're on the bottle too, but you sort of ignore all of that stuff. Um, and you know you, have, you need iron, you need copper, you need calcium, uh, you need zinc, et cetera. And so what I want to do is to try to give you very briefly an overview of why these metals are so important. And again, the focus is going to be um, on iron. Okay. Okay, so here's our periodic table. Um, and these are the metals um, that are found. Um, inside of us, or uh, yeah, I guess maybe. Do we have, we don't have tungsten. Liz, do we have tungsten? We don't have tungsten. So any, I don't think we have tungsten in us. So these are found in bacteria and us, okay. Um, and so if you look at this, all of these guys over here, where have we seen magnesium before? I've been talking about that over and over again. Magnesium is bound to all nucleotides. We're gonna see this again and again. We're gonna talk about a little bit about the properties of magnesium, which makes it function in that capacity um, to neutralize the charge on um, nucleotides, sodium and um, potassium in ion conduction, calcium involved in signaling. Um, but what we're gonna be focusing on are the transition metals. Okay, and specifically within the transition metals, what we're gonna be focusing on is iron. Um, and this is, it's hard to measure um, the concentrations uh, and their localizations within the cell, but you can measure the total concentration by just taking your cell and then um, submitting it to some kind of um, mass spec analysis where you can see iron versus um, manganese. Um, and we're gonna, again, be focused on iron, which accounts for about 8%. Um, and it's been estimated in this article that approximately 50% of all the proteins um, have some kind of metal bound. Okay, it might be involved in catalysis, it might not. In fact, the metals more likely are not involved in catalysis, and we'll look at that distribution. So we'll come back to this a couple of times, but we're gonna be focusing over here. Um, and what are the properties of metals that make them so special to increase the repertoire um, of reactions that can be catalyzed inside our bodies. Okay, so these guys are unique from a lot of the, re uh, the reactions you've already studied in your introductory biochemistry course. And so what I wanna do is sort of just give you a general overview of where you see metals involved in catalysis, and then we're gonna focus on iron only. Okay. Okay, so where do we see um, catalysis? We see iron transport, we need to get iron, potassium, and uh, sodium in the right places and we're in trouble. Um, signaling, um, signal transduction, we use calcium all the time. There's huge numbers of people setting calcium signaling. Where have you seen oxygen transport? In us, we're in serious trouble um, if oxygen can't be carried by our hemoglobin um, to our tissues. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So oxygen transport is really important. Um, of central importance, um, is electron transfer and proton coupled electron transfer. Where have you seen that? You've seen that in the respiratory chain. If you go back and you look at complex one, complex two, complex three, you see all these metals in there. What are they doing? Um, they're doing electron transfer reactions. We'll talk a little bit, but not much about that. Um, so not only is electron transfer involved in respiration, um, electron transfer plays a central role in all of the environmental chemistry. And so while in many introductory classes they don't talk about this, we talk about humans because most people are more interested um, in disease, the coolest chemistry without question, hands down, is absolutely associated with the bacteria and the archae. Okay, they do like amazing things. How do you take nitrogen and do an eight electron reduction to ammonia? Okay, how do we do that as chemists? 200 atmospheres pressure in a 400 degrees, okay? 
um, is very, this is an incredibly important reaction. Where does all the nitrogen from our amino acids come from? What about our nucleic acids? And we skip all this stuff. This is like, I mean, this to me is sort of like amazing. Another thing um, we skip all the time is where does oxygen, how does oxygen, where do we, how does light take water and make oxygen gas? Without that, we'd be in serious trouble. Um, the bacteria would definitely be taking over the world, right? Um, and so, th and this I'll show you is sort of an amazing reaction. Nucleotide reduction, we may never get there, but the last module is, I'm gonna show you, you're making um, deoxynucleotides, right? The enzymes can use manganese, iron, cobalt, and iron sulfur. So they use a wide range of metals to make the building blocks required for DNA. Okay, signaling. We've all, I just talked about calcium as a signaling agent, um, but now it's becoming clear because of um, studies from, from the Lipid Group and studies from Chris Chang, who is a former Lipid Group member, um, signaling of metals is much more common than we thought. Um, and people are proposing that not only do, is zinc a signaling agent, but also copper. So I think you're going to, and there's a lot of problems in nerve cells with oxidative damage, which we're going to come back to. So thinking about the levels and sensing of these levels, I think is going to be a future area that's going to be very exciting um, to study. Um, you have to regulate these metals, transcriptional, translational levels we're going to talk about. Um, and they're involved in many kinds of catalysis. Um, so let me just close by showing you one last slide. Uh, oxygen carriers, okay. You've seen this before, that's hemoglobin. You've all studied, hopefully, hemoglobin and the cooperative binding of oxygen, how it binds, how it's released, sort of an amazing um, machine. That's not the only way that organisms reversibly bind oxygen. This guy is a horseshoe crab. It uses copper, okay? This guy, these are worms. These are found in the, in, and they're found in the sea, right? You, see, you, go, you go to Woods Hole and they'll extract these worms for you. Anyhow, what do they have? They have a di-iron cluster. And the strategies, of re, they, both, they all have to reversely bind oxygen, and they've all adapted to their environments to be able to do this in an efficient way. So what I'll do next time is come back and let me just do one more thing. Anyhow, this is it. Think about this. Put it under your pillow. Think about how it works. Look at this. This is the cofactor of nitrogenase. Not only does it have iron and molybdenum, look at that guy in the center. Carbon. Carbon 4 minus. Think about that. We'll come back next time. <laughs>